Welcome to the Thin Places Travel Podcast, where we discuss places where the veil between this world and the eternal world is thin. I'm your host, Mindy Burgoyne. The rocky part in the north there is a lot of the soil has gone missing from the hills of the garden, and you can see the bedrock of the planet, the skeleton of the universe. So it's a most on Irish landscape, but much more than that, it's a rare global land for the world eccentric landscapes in Europe. Coming up, we'll hear from Tony Kirby, who will talk with us about the Burren in West County Clare. Hello and welcome to Episode 9 of the Thin Places Travel Podcast. Today, our featured destination is the Burren in County Clare. Entire books have been written about this 200 acres of rocky limestone that borders the Atlantic Ocean. It's a landscape of myths and legends and sacred ground with archaeological remnants that date back thousands of years. And it's also a landscape of contrasts. That gray rock against the blue sky are the mountains and hills that rise out of seemingly endless flat bedrock. The contrasts are particularly powerful in the spring when the flowers of the burn come into bloom. Tiny little orchids pop up between the slabs of limestone. Most people who visit the burn just drive through. They might stop at the more famous locations like the Polnebrone Dolmen. Or the the burn perfumery is also a, a famous place. People love that. Or they take the obligatory photo of Lamine Castle. Uh, they might stop at Corkumroe Abbey. But the burn itself is a sacred landscape. And the, the poet philosopher John O'Donohue, who is from the Burren region, uh, s- summed it up like this. He said, it's a bare limestone landscape. And I often think that the forms of the limestone are so abstract and aesthetic, it is as if they were all laid down by some wild, surrealistic kind of deity. Being a child and coming out into that, it was like a huge, wild invitation to extend your imagination. I can't even count the number of times I've been to the Burren, and I remember on my first trip to Ireland, I had no role in planning that itinerary. I just went along with some friends who had invited me, and I enjoyed whatever they did. I knew nothing about the country. But my friend Hal McConnell, who was a great mystic and brilliant philosopher, he was the planner of our Ireland tour. He said, now we will enter the mystical landscape of the Burren where everything seems harsh and stark, but there is an underlying sacredness about the place. Now, that wasn't unusual for him to say that because he was always saying those kinds of things. But I remember as we did go into it thinking, you know, he was right. You don't get it at first. You just see a lot of rock. But especially if you step out of the car into that landscape, you can start to feel the pulse this sort of vibration from beneath you um, that, that radiates this kind of sacred energy. And though you, can't, you can catch glimpses of the highlights in driving through, I just can't emphasize enough, it's so important to walk the landscape. Or better yet, treat yourself to a walking tour led by a guide who knows his way around and can reveal parts of that landscape that you probably wouldn't find on your own. Our favorite burn tour guide is Tony Kirby, and he is our guest this week on the podcast. We're very happy to have Tony Kirby with us today. He leads Heart of the Burn Walks. He's a self-taught, full-time walking tour operator at Heart of the Burn Walks. He's been doing that for 15 years. Tony lives in the burn with his family and does about 240 walking tours each year. Welcome, Tony. Thank you very much, Mindy. Thanks for having me. Oh, we're we're delighted to have you. Um, Tony, by the way, is the tour guide we get when we take our group tours to the Burren, and my guests love him. Um, so you do live in the Burren, right? You live up near Kilnaboy? Is that where you live? That's correct, yeah. I, I've been living here about 15 years. I mean, I moved uh, originally from Limerick City, but moved from Dublin City here with uh, my wife about 15 years ago, just for a new life, and that's when I actually reinvented myself as a walking tourism operator and um, it was slow to start but now thankfully it's a full-time living. It is and what how did you get interested in doing walking tours? Uh, 
I'll try to make the story as short as possible. I had been living in Italy on a sabbatical from the public service in Dublin, Ireland. And when I came back to resume my job in the civil service, I was quite disillusioned with it. And I decided in order to keep up my Italian, keep up my contact with Italian people, and just a newfound interest in our heritage, I decided to use the streets of Dublin as my university to do walking tours there and learn on the hoof. So I am self-taught and then it transferred to the part and I thought the logical thing to do would be try to, without my civil service stipend or remuneration or emolument, just to try and come up with another way of living. I was forced to do it. And that's why I decided uh, to do the the walking tourism in the Barton. And now, like, instead of the streets of Dublin being my university, it's the, the, the rocky, majestic Barton in North Clare in the west of Ireland, which is my third level college. That's wonderful. Well, tell us, if you were to uh, tell somebody about the Burren who had never been there, what would you say? Okay, it's a most on Irish landscape uh, because Ireland has, you know, the biggest percentage of agricultural grasslands in the world, apart from New Zealand, the Emerald Isle, the four green fields, the 40 shades of green, and all that baloney. But <laughs> the rocky Burren in North Clare is a lot of the soil has gone missing from the hills in the Burren. And you can see the bedrock of the planet, the skeleton of the universe. So it's a most on Irish landscape, but much more than that, it's a rare global landform and one of the most eccentric landscapes in Europe. The rock is called limestone. You know, it, it's called specifically limestone pavement. There is, it's the biggest, most extensive area of limestone pavement uh, in all of the European Union 28 countries. So not only is it geologically important, but just to look at it, the physical aspect of it, is very strange to, for a person to see. So it's, it's, but again, you throw in other things like the exceedingly rich archaeological landscape that it hosts, and also the fact that it's of real international consequence in terms of wild plants, makes it a very compelling place for visitors to stop out for a while at in under a visit to Ireland. Yeah, yeah. They, what if, if someone was visiting the Burn, other than booking a tour with you, what advice would you give them about approaching their visit to the Burn? Well, if they're not if, if they're visiting Burn and not uh, booking toward me, I'd advise them not to come. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, on, a more, <laughs> on, a more, on a more serious note, um, we have a national park here. It's one of only six national parks in the Republic of Ireland. So, there's seven walking trails on it. So, they, they these these could be readily explored by, you know, visitors to the Burn. Um, the um, there's about 2,000 archaeological monuments in the 200 square miles. If they, so that's worth, they're worth checking out. The icon of prehistoric Ireland is here, no less. That's the Pound of Rowan Dolmen, which has been scientifically dated to 5,800 years ago, the oldest bones. That's worth a visit free of charge as well. Um, and if visitors come between, like in the flowering season, which is a few months of the year, it is quite an extraordinary sight to see this fertile rock, this great ecological paradox of the, the drab grey hills in winter being transformed in spring into a mosaic of flowers from different parts of the world. But the high point of the flower season is the peak of it. You know, the, the so-called burn and bloom is mid-May to mid-June. And uh, if you can catch it around that time, you're especially lucky because that is one of the great annual natural history events of Europe. Yeah, I will comment on that. The we always, when we go to the burn, it's always in May for that reason. Right. Um, yeah. Because the, uh, you can see this glacial uh, rock, just flat rock everywhere as far as you can see. And then yeah. peeking up in between the rocks are these little orchids. Uh, yeah. It's very beautiful little flowers. Yeah, there's, a, there's a gentleman called uh, Bob Gibbons. He's like yourself. He's a tour operator in part, and he's a botanical tour operator. So he brings his groups on flower. Uh, vacations all over the world. He wrote a book in 2011, Wildflower Wonders of the World, and then he profiled subjectively what he considered to be the top 50 botanical regions on Earth. And Ireland, County Clare, Ireland is, in his opinion, one of the top 50 botanical regions of the world. So that's that's an idea of its international importance. All right. Well, let's uh, talk about some of the sites um, in the Burren. But let's just go with the Pol Nebron, since everyone knows that. Mm -hmm. what, what would you say yeah. about the Pol Nebron? If you were well, telling it's, about it. Yeah, it's it's uh, just to describe it physically, there's there's lateral stones put in the crevices of the rock, and then there's a, a slanting uh, roof to a capstone, which is 1.5 tons in weight, which is angled towards the east, which for spiritual purposes. Um, 
it, it was designed as a spectacle 6,000 years ago. It was designed as a very strong statement of, you know, power of, 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 of uh, pioneer farmers in the region. And today it's still unwittingly on their part. It's creating that spectacular effect, which is drawing in a couple of hundred thousand people every year. You know, people are, are attracted by its antiquity, but it's sheer, you know, the spectacular value of it. So number one, for the people who built it, it was a, a profound political statement, a statement of territory, don't mess with us. But the second reason they built it was, um, it, it's a funerary monument. It's, it was a monument for the special dead from that period, you know, the, the, the Stone Age period, right across the northwest of Europe, where they had this culture of putting their special day in big stone structures, and perhaps the bones inside. It was a cult of the ancestors, and I say perhaps, I mean definitely, the bones of the dead inside were an intermediary between this world where the living were and the other world, whatever it was. But the, the final reason it was built, and the most central reason these tombs were built, these so-called megalithic tombs, big stone tombs, is, uh, Apart from political and funerary, the central reason why they built them was spiritual. Uh, the idea of them being temples of stone. So the equivalent today of 21st century synagogues or mosques or, you know, Christian churches. Um, these are about our ancestors' desire, their quest for understanding, you know, their, their idea of understanding the twin mysteries of life and death. So they're highly spiritual places. And um, that, that, that's, that's really the central purpose of them. And when they excavated it, what did they find? They found uh, the bones of 33 individuals. They were buried there over dated the bones to uh, a period of 600 years. Uh, so it's a very selective burial of your dead. We don't know why these people were so select. They, uh, the, they concluded from examination of the bones of these people had short physical and violent lives. Um, they um, also found grave goods. Um, including um, a polished stone axe, which is just too small to cut trees, but it was probably deep in symbolism for them, the idea of in homage to the axe that cuts us to trees that gives us our pastoral living. Uh, they found uh, stone and bone pendants, which are things that are used aesthetically on, on their bodies. Uh, these were grave offerings as well. And they found um, bones of wild and domestic animals, perhaps they were sacrificial kings, you know, big deal for them to kill their domestic animals and not to eat them, so just to, you know, harbour good relations with the gods. And they also found two pieces of quartz crystal, and that's a recurring theme, not just in pre-Christianity, but also to uh, extend Christianity, the idea of quartz being, uh, of you know, having a lot of sacred energy and probably a symbol of purity. So essentially, uh, the bones of the special dead and grave goods. Great, that's interesting. And um, can you say anything about um, Corcumro? Corcumbro Abbey, yeah, it's uh, probably the most spectacular building in all of the 200 square miles of the barn. It's, um, it's an abbey, it's a, it was built by the Cistercians, who were the very first European order to come into Ireland, a French order, the Grey Friars, they were called, and they came in here in the 1100s as part of this religious revolution, you know, the collapse of the early Christian Ireland, the land of saints and scholars, that extraordinary period in our story when this small peripheral island was at the avant-garde of European civilization in terms of particularly of, uh, of art. Um, but that all did collapse and it had gone from austerity and, you know, to, to, to decadence and it, towards the 10 and 1100. So it was tailor-made for religious revolution and in came the new European orders like the Cistercians, the Augustinians, the Dominicans, Franciscans. And the Cistercians were at the forefront of this new movement, which essentially came in to Romanize this kind of idiosyncratic Irish church. And Dara Malloy, who I believe was one of your guests on the podcast, he describes this uh, influx of European orders with the, these experienced multinationals, if you like to call them that, mm -hmm. and this phenomenon is the globalization of God, the Europeanization of the Irish church. So most of all, I suppose, Corporal Moabi is a symbol of the, the standardization of the Irish church in this great new wave of European orders coming in with those huge statements in stone, these big new churches in stone uh, with great artwork. It was a statement of the religious, it's a big statement of the religious revolution around the start of the 1800s. What's interesting about it at a local level, Mindy, is the dedication of that abbey, uh, Kirk and Row. It's dedicated in Latin to Santa Maria del Pietra Fertilis, which means St. Mary of the Fertile Rock. So 
this is the nickname still today of the Berlin. It's called the Fertile Rock, and it's all because the Cistercians 900 years ago captured the great ecological paradox of rock and flowers of Berlin in the dedication of that abbey, which is in a, a beautiful, remote, fertile valley and would be, you know, access all areas free of charge. So again, for your visitors that are self-guided, it would be strongly recommended. So that's, yeah, I, I have loved Cork and Rose since the first time I saw it, and we always go there. If we have to even buzz through the burn, we go to Cork and Rose and the Pole and the right. Brown. Yeah, it's the right. Pole and the Brown because everybody has to see the Pole and the Brown at least once. It's just such a an amazing sight. But Cork and Rose, there's something really special about where it's positioned in the landscape. You know, the, it, I have a lot of energy workers and, you know, Reiki healers. Yes. That come, and when they get to Cork and Row, um, there's they'll all talk about the vibration that comes from the land there in that one particular spot. And on the other side of Cork and Row, um, like if you're entering the gates, if you're facing them, the abbey's on your left, to your right, down in that little hill, um, is a another, I guess, a remnant of one of the buildings that was there, a really old foundation. Um, and that's a, a place people are attracted to for that sort of otherworldly sense. I don't know why. It's not, uh, it's just, uh, when I go there, the, the people on our tours are always pulled in that direction. So yeah, can, I, can I say as well, Mindy, it's worth pointing out about that little valley in which they selected the, um, they selected for the abbey is, what's really fascinating about it, you know, all the medieval abbeys that are are built on rivers. There is no river in that valley where it's built, but there's actually five streams and that's their source of water. And also it's worth pointing out, there's a holy well on site as well, which may not just predate the Cistercians there, but predate Christianity. So perhaps people well before the, you know, the advent of history here uh, identify that place as being you know, a particularly energetic place in the landscape. Right. That, that, I did not know that. That's a good thing to, uh, to know. We'll have to get you to step on our bus and go there next time and show us that. My, my, my motto is I may not be any good, but I always turn up. <laughs> You're good. You're good. Um, I want to ask you about the sacred landscape in the Burren, uh, the pilgrim paths, the holy wells. I, I read on your blog that, or actually I think I read it in the commentary that you provided us. And this is uh, something you're highlighting now. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, the sacred landscape? Yeah, well, I suppose um, we touched on it already when we mentioned um, Paolo Brown. So, you know, at least going back, 5,800 years ago, we have, you know, physical evidence in the landscape of the sanctity of the place. Uh, we've got about, uh, oh, I think it's just less than 100 prehistoric tombs. Ponobron is just one of less than, what just less than 100 prehistoric tombs in the 200 square miles. So that's, if you like, 1995 prehistoric temples of stones. So that's an idea of the, the density of the concentration of, you know, sacred monuments going back to the very beginning here of the farming community but then you push into uh, christian times and with the highest concentration of ecclesiastical sites in ireland that are just just over 30 identified here there's 60 holy wells which is you know again it's a very high concentration of holy wells in the region um and then of course we have you know uh, medieval abbeys like kirkham row uh, Kilfenora and Kilchani as well. So the, the physical evidence of the sanctity of the landscape is very compelling. Um, we have pilgrim paths here. No doubt the Burren was a very rich pilgrimage landscape. Unfortunately, scholastic discussion on it has been limited. But one can readily conclude that all of the ecclesiastical sites, 30 or so of them, and all of the 60 holy wells were, uh, and some still are, a minority them, the focus of, you know, uh, pilgrimage. Wow, that's really uh, mm. and it, with the burn is what two hundred square miles? Is that how big? Yeah, it is? so it's, it's it's not a very big area. Like uh, you're familiar with Connemara, north of the Burren, right? In the west of Galway, which is our the our home to some of the last great peatlands of Europe. But Connemara is eight hundred square miles, so it's four times the size of the Burren. But what's fascinating about the Burren, even though it's relatively small, how much it punches above the weight as a heritage landscape internationally. That it's an exceedingly rich heritage landscape, particularly in terms of geology, botany, and archaeology, but just more besides. Are there any, um, is the mythology or the legends in the Burren, is that as rich as it is in other places? Absolutely. Like, it, it would be, 
evenly spread all over Ireland. You know, the idea of, you know, mythology in the landscape, not science, to say in a pre-science era, people used their imagination to come to terms with the landscape, to understand features in it and understand, tackle the, the twin mysteries of life and death as well. So it is a quite a rich mythological landscape as well. And a lot of the riches of mythology is in the place name. So, for example, there's a number of townlands, which are the townland, the smallest geographical unit in Ireland, but there's a number of townlands in the, in the Burren with the, the name Kuka in it. And Kuka, of course, was a fairy, and he was a nasty bit of work. Some fairies were nice, but some were nasty. And the Kuka was a nasty bit of work, much feared, kind of a, in the form of a horse with a, a long mane and sulfur eyes, tattered remote farm at night. And, you know, even uh, in the National Park here, with two really idiosyncratic features on a hill here called uh, in Gaelic Lehman Puka Pyog, Lehman Puka Muir, which are translated as the big Puka's leap or jump and a small Puka's jump. So one could jump the two of them, but a smaller one could only jump the smaller one of them. And who knows, but, you know, that's certainly evidence that people in the past were trying to impose their imagination on the landscape to reconcile themselves with it. But who knows, there may have been ritual there in the past in those two idiosyncratic cavities by people to harbor good relations with this spirit of Buddha. Isn't that something? Um, I, I want to just comment here that you've got a blog as well as your website. We'll have all of this on the show notes so that people can go back and actually find the links and go to see these websites. But um, the, you have a new blog, and I just looked over it this morning and was so impressed. I w- I'm going to go right back to it. Because um, you do have a Thank great flair, yeah, a great flair for writing in this uh, burntales.com. Um, I guess it's a blog you've done with a uh, photographer, Karsten Krieger. So they're beautiful yeah. photographs of the of the burn, but also your commentary about the burn and various sites. Um, it's just brilliant. It's very worth you know, very worthwhile site to visit. So often these days, you go to sites and there's little on them, but that's mm. packed full of stuff. Thank you very much, Mindy. Thanks for that. And tell, how, Tell me why you did that. What what compelled you to, to do that? Oh, um, just because well, you have all of this free time when you don't work. That yeah. <laughs> <laughs> between what is this October? I wish I was you. October to April, you get to hang out and just kind of write. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't in the Caribbean. Yeah, that's where I go to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I want to lay it on a bit thicker. The whole thing. I, I actually, yeah, I, I, no. In uh, yeah, I suppose in, in the winter here. Um, I do uh, have a family, young family, so um, uh, that that would be number one. I see a bit less of them during the summer, so a bit more time with them in the winter. That would be number one for me. But, yeah, you do have more free time in the winter. It's nature tourism for a lot of people. And in my spare time now, in the winter, I've got much more disciplined at writing. It's a, I just love writing. I love words, uh, whether, you know, trying to... Uh, speak them or write them down. I just love putting words together, get a kick out of it. And I think the burden, uh, just so the, the, the heritage of burden is so infinite, and yet a lot of it has not been documented. So that's what I'm really trying to do is just document things that are of interest to me, but also that have not really been covered thus far in writing in the burden. I just got a great kick out of it. And um, Enjoy it immensely, and I, I, as I say, I'm kind of lucky that Carson Creel, who's an outstanding landscape photographer, he's published eight books, particularly uh, on the Atlantic landscape of Ireland, the west of Ireland. I'm just fortunate to be collaborating with, with, with Carson on it, and um, I get, I, I get a, a lot of satisfaction from it. Oh, yeah, and you're going to launch a site on the Burn Holy Wells. Yeah, no, that's with another German photographer by coincidence. Her name is Karen Funk. And uh, myself and Karen, I'd say in the next uh, week or so, we'd hope to go live with uh, burnholywells.com. And again, uh, quite st- scholastic discussion and things like the tombs here and uh, maybe some of the medieval um, uh, abbeys has been quite good. Uh, the documentary... Document, documentation on the Holy Wells is limited, and I think yet we'd never get a full understanding of the landscape if we don't include sites like Holy Wells, which, even though they might be physically ephemeral, are critical to understanding of our, uh, uh, the past uh, in the region. So that's what we're going to do. We're trying to do just about 60 Holy Wells here, and we'd like to just document them all photographically and as much as we can in writing about them as well. So that's going to go live in the next week or so. 
And are they Christian holy wells or pre-Christian or both? Oh, that's a, a vexed question, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, like, I think the majority scholastic take on that now, Mindy, is that the holy well in Ireland is of pre-Christian or pagan origin, probably a cultural overspill from Roman pagan Britain. But when, the, when Ireland was Christianized in the 5th century AD, the Christians here, being very clever operators, decided to adopt elements of the pre-Christian Christianity into Christianity in order to make the transition extremely peaceful and successful. And of course, it was an extraordinarily peaceful and successful transition from pre-Christianity to Christianity here in Ireland because a lot of pagan cult, like the, the goddesses of gods, were adopted as saints. A lot of pagan ritual, like this water uh, worship or uh, hydrology, to put it more in a more sophisticated way, were adopted by them. So I, I would say, short answer to your question, uh, pre-Christian origin, but most of the wells in Ireland now would be Christian um, inventions, mm -hmm. or definitely pre Christian origin. Most yeah. of them. And you're also going to do a website soon on the Killeens. Can you talk just a little bit about that? Yeah, well, that's a, it, that's quite it. What's the Holy Wells is an old interest of mine. Killeens is very much a recent uh, interest, uh, newfound interest. The Killeens are uh, burial sites prevalently for unbaptized children on unconsecrated ground. So uh, it's, it's hard to believe that this obtained, still existed in Ireland right in the 1960s. It probably started in the 1600s, medieval, Middle Ages, reaction of the Catholic Church to the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation, getting a bit tougher uh, and kind of tightening up things a bit to compete with uh, product, the new religion of Protestantism. They came up with this idea of certain categories, categories of otherness, people who were considered not to be equal in debt to others, and the idea of them not getting buried on, on consecrated ground. And the biggest category of others who they consider not entitled to very unsafe ground were unbaptized uh, children. And in Ireland, we have, you know, thousands of these sites, extremely poignant places where they, they're living, they're buried, these uh, unbaptized children in very humble circumstances, in unmarked, with very uh, rudimentary, primitive, unmarked stones for the graves. They're, they're the forgotten dead. And um, in the in the bar, in care we have a staggering 150 uh, killings or unbaptized children burial ground. And uh, in the borough, I'd estimate about 30 or so. And again, I think we should document and celebrate these just as much as the more big ticket sites inverted commas in order to get a more complete picture of the past. Yeah, I, I, I know that that's a big movement in Ireland. I have other friends that are involved in the, the sort of uh, identifying the killings and um, and marking them. I mean, there are some beautiful um, efforts being made. Um, just, in fact, there's one, um, a friend of mine, uh, Ruth O'Hagan, who lives in East Clare, showed me near, I can't remember what the name of the town was now, uh, but it was the community. They got together and found this and they just decorated it and, you know, created it like a little park. And I guess it wasn't just on baptized children that, like, as you say, that was the predominant um, the predominant population, but it was also strangers or absolutely yeah. suicide or anybody that would be uh, not dying in, uh, I guess, in communion with the with the church. So that's a that's a wonderful effort, and that's a very big curiosity, I think, with travelers who are, you know, on this sort of sacred journey like we do, going to the thin places. The Killeens are big, and so you're going to have that in a website along with the Holy Wells. Are you? I I have your book here. Um, and what's so nice about your tour, well, this is a wonderful book because it's a walking guide, the Burren and the Aran Islands. Um, and the, the walks in the Burren are beautifully identified and, you know, with little maps. And what's so great about going on your tour is you have these in the trunk of your car. <laughs> you just pull them yeah, out. And yeah. the best love, oh gosh, it's like a mad rush. You want to buy my book? And they all, oh, got to buy your book. So, um, yeah, yeah. It, it, it goes with me everywhere, you know, I'm kind of a, <laughs> I'm an impoverished author, like there's a lot of them on this planet. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, anyway, the, with that book, uh, I mean, I want to mention that book and we'll have the information in the show notes about your book, but do you have any, um, are you going to write another one? Are well, I, I suppose I would consider, uh, Mindy, uh, that the, the Holy Wells website essentially is an online book. Mm -hmm. And to the Killeen's, the Killeen's one, similarly to Killeen's website, 
would essentially be an online book and with the possibility in the future of coming up with hard copies of both of them. So they are two that are definitely, you know, on the go at the moment and I would envisage them. I did the hope would be that the intention would be that they could go from offline, uh, sorry, online to hard copies, eventually both of them. Yeah. Oh, that'd be great. Are you going to do walking tours of those two? Or I guess you can't really do walking tours. You could do a couple on each tour, maybe. Yeah. Well, on one. Yeah. Um, well, like there's one particular site, just to give you an example, it's called Temple Cronin. Um, and it's a magnificent early Christian monastic site in the secluded valley here. But on site, uh, the graveyard of the early Christian monks and abbot was reinvented as a Killeen by those people who were marginalized at some stage in the past. So on site at this, you know, now deconsecrated early Christian site, you have a Killeen uh, right by the church because these people who were excluded from consecrated ground would then look for play other places which had an aura of sanctity, next best thing. So on site there, you also have a holy well dedicated dedicated to Cronin and of course you have a missing walking trail so there are possibilities within the Berlin of guided walking tours which would incorporate all of these elements into one you know half day walking tour you know yeah that's the tour that we went on um yeah. I'm pretty sure yeah, yeah that's a yeah. beautiful tour you did indeed Mindy yeah yeah and, and the greatest thing about your tours other than being so informational and your magnetic personality is that you oh. stop occasionally <laughs> <laughs> is that you, occasionally you just uh, recite a poem, uh, which is so inspiring. So I asked you if you could recite a poem. Do you have a poem in your head or do you have to, do you have one handy that you, you can? Know, yeah, I, I, I have one. I'll tell you what I'll go for today, if you don't mind. I'll go for, um, I, I'll go for a very short poem um, by William Butler Yeats. Uh, Yeats won the Nobel Prize for Literature in the uh, first half of the 20th century. Is considered by many, including the late great Leonard Cohen, to be one of the finest poets in the English language of the 20th century. Um, and he has a strong burning connection in the sense that um, a play of his, The Dreaming of the Bones, a work of his, The Dreaming of the Bones, is actually set at Corkham Abbey, which we're talking about. So I think that nicely ties up uh, uh, our, our interview today. Um, the poem is called Politics. Um, it was written in the late 1930s which means two things. One, Yeats was an old, an elderly man, so it's written from the perspective of an elderly man. And the second thing is that a war, a world war is imminent. So we'll just give this, uh, give this a cut. It's called Politics by William Walker Yeats. How can I, that girl standing there, my attention fix on Roman or Russian or Spanish politics? Yet there's a well-traveled man who knows what he talks about. And there is a politician who has read and thought, and perhaps what they say is true of war and war's alarms. But oh, that I were young again and held her in my arms. Oh, that's beautiful, politics. And that's what your tours are like. You go to a stop and you describe the wonderful place and then you have a little poem and we walk on and it's just a wonderful experience. It's all coming back to me now, Tony. I've got, I've got, to, I've got to get you get you on a tour very soon. Well, thanks thanks so much for having me on today. I mean, much, much, much appreciated. You know, lovely talk to you again, you know. And so tell us how, uh, thank you. It's a great talking to you. Tell us how people can find you. What's your website? Yeah, the, the website is heartofburnwalks.com. So that, that's that's the best way of getting in touch. Yeah. Heart yeah. of Burn Walks. And you have a Facebook page too. We'll have that all. Yeah, yeah. I have indeed. Yeah. And, yeah. and I have a lovely little video of you, which I'm also going to post, just of you uh, on tour at one stop with the poem at the end. So I'll post that's that great. as well. Great. I'll post that as well. Well, thanks so yeah. much for talking with me today. And um, Heart of the Burn Walks, right? Heart of the Burn Walks is your website. Heart, heart, heart of Burn Walks. Yeah. Okay. Heart no of Burn Walks. Heart no of Burn Walks. Heart if of you don't mind, Mindy, I'd like to conclude with a couple of uh, words in Gaelic, uh, the Irish language, and I'll translate it for you then. It's Gunnardig on Boherlat, which translated to English means, may the road rise with you. Oh, thank you, Tony. Well, thank you for visiting with us. We'll be in touch soon. Great, Mindy. Thanks very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.
playing off the discussion Tony and I had about the burn and specifically Cork and Row Abbey, I'd like to talk a little bit more about Cork and Row. It's a 12th century monastic ruin that was once occupied by the Cistercians, as we noted. But Cork and Row is also a rare place in that it is a place, in my opinion, of two worlds. If you ever wanted to test your sensitivity to being able to feel the other world or sense the energy of a thin place, Cork and Row would be a perfect place to spot to start that. Have you ever felt like you um, walked into a place that was sort of surrounding you with memories or swirling with memories? You know, graveyards do this for me. I know that I feel differently when I cross, as soon as I cross the threshold into a graveyard or cemetery. But if I really examine what that feeling is, it tends to be a swirling of memories, the stories of the deceased, the images of those that mourned them, that visited the graves, that stood by the graveside when they were lowered in, um, people that carved the sculptures of these ornate monuments over graves or the stone cutters that etched the names into the graves. All of, these, all of these pieces of what comprises a cemetery seems to, they seem to come back to me as I walk through it. Uh, cemeteries and graveyards are places of, of remembrance. And so the memories come around you. But Corkham Row kind of projects its memories into the landscape. I, I, I often feel this way when I go to monastic ruins that I you know, what were the monks like? What was it like here? You try to reimagine the place in its time. But Cork and Rose is a little different. If you quiet yourself and center and ground yourself and then approach those abbey ruins, you'll begin to feel those memories swirl around you. And notice the details because Cork and Rose is full of them. Even just the setting, the setting of that monastery, it's set in a valley uh, known to be on what was called the Path of the Monks or the Trail of the Monks, because the monks would travel this pass to go into a village and then come back to the monastery. So it's it's got three major, ra- very, very round top, not really tall mountains surrounding it. And if you're lucky enough to go to Corkham Row when it's raining or kind of off and on raining, then you'll really see the magic of the place because the the stone on top of those mountains, they're gray and, and white like the limestone. They're not all tree covered like most mountains. When it gets wet and then the sun sort of peeks out from behind the clouds, the, the tops of those mountains just glisten like diamonds. It's an amazing sight. I've often tried to capture it with a camera and I, I can't because the mountains are too far away, but it, it, it is a detail that is mesmerizing. As you walk into the monastery, you look at the um, the effigy of the chieftain king, King Connor, Connor O'Brien. And if you look at that effigy for a while and listen with your internal ear, the effigy will speak to you. And you'll notice things like the smile on the bishop's face above the effigy, the bluebells, uh, the heads on the um, on the pillars all the human faces that are carved into them, the poppies. There's little details everywhere. If you walk the the cloister walk or look at it sort of with your inner eye, you can see the monks walking. You can imagine them walking that cloister walk. You can follow them. You can hear their prayers. It's so easy to step back in time in this particular place. And I have personally had this little spiritual exercise that I do when I'm meditating while I walk or while I'm out uh, by myself in these wild places or these thin places. And I find that when I, a great confirmation that comes to me from the other world, the eternal world, is the shape of a heart. And it's just been many years I felt this way. I'll I'll be conversing internally and then I'll notice on the ground a perfectly heart-shaped rock or even a leaf that has crumpled and is in the shape of a heart or uh, you know, a gnarly part of a tree or a cloud or any kind of a, a little watermarking, a puddle that will be in the shape of a heart. And for me, that's just kind of a personal 
confirmation. I keep it to myself. Most people think I'm crazy. I have a little hashtag, I see hearts, because I do. But I only see hearts when, uh, when I'm in this kind of a state. Anyway, uh, the last time I was at Cork and Row, I was walking out. The, I was with a tour group that I brought there, and we were leaving. And I wanted to take one last picture of the east wall, which is the wall. It's a big wall with a lancet window. It's beautiful. And as I took the picture, I didn't realize until I actually looked at it on my phone that the sun had cast a perfectly shaped heart um, on the wall. So the light was the heart and the rest of the wall was in shadow. So I'll I'll put that on the um, show notes if you care to see it. It really was quite brilliant. But I find that the signs are bigger, stronger, greater when you're at a place that is ultimately, you know, thin, just really, really thin place. Cork and Roe is like that. The effigy of King Connor O'Brien is what most people tend to remember from Cork and Roe. Um, and that's exactly what was intended when it was put there 750 years ago. It was meant to be a very startling reminder of a man who was well-loved or, or revered. And in 1268, Conor O'Brien, who was then Lord of Thomond, and his son um, and his daughter and his grandson were among people that were slain in a battle near the Abbey. And I've seen this referred to more as an ambush, but it wasn't far from Corcomero where they they fell. They were butchered by somebody who was coveting the power that Conor O'Brien had. And when Conor O'Brien was brought back to be buried at at Corcomero, they they took out part of the floor and, and made that little niche where the effigy is. And then they put that effigy on top of the tomb. And from what I have read, there is only two, there are only two of these effigies that commemorate kings like this in Ireland, Irish kings. The other was from Roscom and they were built, they were carved about the same time. And one went here to commemorate Conor O'Brien's um, memory. But it, it's quite startling to see it there. And he is buried just beneath it. And right next to him on the floor, um, evidently were put out some of his warriors. So they sort of lay beside him. And there's a short poem that appeared in the Irish Monthly in 1911 with a reference of RMG about Conor O'Brien and this place where he is in Corcomeral. And it it goes like this. Conor O'Brien of the Kings, how sound you sleep in Corcomeral. The night wind and the choir sings the hymns of many a year ago. What day was that when you were born by warriors from the field of red? Your blade was broke, your side was torn. They laid you in your royal bed. They ripped the chancel's paven floor and laid your warriors there in rows. Their requiem is the tempest's roar. Their souls are sped where no man knows. Thank you for listening to the Thin Places Travel Podcast. You can find us on the web at thinplacespodcast.com and find me on Twitter at at travelhags or facebook.com forward slash thinplaces. In our next episode, our guest will be Mary Reynolds, an Irish garden and landscape designer famous for her wild gardens and her focus on bringing back the wild places. So long for now. Thank you for listening. And please be sure to check out our tours to mystical sites at thinplacestour.com. The music for this podcast is Native Spirit, performed by Cheryl Ann Fulton from her collection, The Once and Future Harp. Goodbye for now. Wishing you love and light and every blessing.